Hello, and welcome back, friends, to uh, what are we calling this? I guess we're going to call it narrative gazing until we can come up with a better title. How does that sound? Yeah, I think that's what we're going with. Anyway, today is May the 2nd, 2023, the day after World Communism Day. How was everybody's World Communism Day? Let me know down in the comments. Let me know your favorite way to celebrate World Communism Day, seeing as that is the most recently passed holiday in COVID land. Today, uh, we are going to get together to take a look at a video that was sent to me by one of my sources, which shall rename, remain nameless for the time being, easy for me to say, uh, unless you want me to give out your name. Uh, if you do, hit me up in the, in the DMs and we'll uh, get that figured out. But it was also shared around in the Liberty Radio Telegram channel, which if you haven't joined the Liberty Radio Telegram channel, I, I'm really not even sure what you're doing with your life at this point because you could have already had the opportunity to view this video days and days ago and you would not have to invest your precious time right now doing so. Uh, but that's, that's another story for another video. The long and the short of it is join the Liberty Radio Telegram channel. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the link is t.me forward slash gtw. Liberty Radio, and that should get you to the right spot. But as I said, this video was vetted by Space Jelly in the Liberty Radio Telegram channel, and she gave it the thumbs up. So that means it's likely safe for consumption. We are going to dig into it. Let's take a look at exactly what this video is. I think we're gonna be getting censored. I think you're probably right, JP, but uh, we're going to press on anyway because that's just how you do it when you are learning your way forward. So the video is titled Meet the So-Called Independent Alternative Media, Dig Into Rumble. As of this filming, it has already garnered more than 22,000 views more than 1,500 thumbs up, and it comes from the channel Amazing Polly over on BitChute. Let's see, did I actually flip my camera over? I did, I did, I actually remembered to do it. That's pretty cool. So what we're gonna do is we are going to watch this video together. I'm likely going to pause it and interrupt it at certain points with very bad jokes. I may even have a couple of insightful observations that I'll offer from time to time. Uh, that's not a promise though. So uh, don't, uh, don't write that one down if you're scoring at home. But we're gonna find out what Amazing Polly has to say about the folks uh, over at Rumble. And then once we're done, we're gonna compare notes. So make sure you hang around to the end of the video, like, subscribe, share, do all of the things. Uh, but this is a long one to begin with, and I don't want to take any more of your time than necessary. So let's just go ahead and jump into it. Did you hear Tucker Carlson got fired from Fox News? But wait, stop. Don't click away if you don't care about that, because my video today is not really about that, although I am going to talk about it a little bit as we go along, because it makes my point. And my point is that as we speak, the new establishment media is being formed. And it's still all about the investment cycle with the added twist of generating outrage in order to produce the returns on these investments. Mostly today what I'm going to talk about is, this is so odd that these are all cut off. Anyway, okay. I'm going to talk about the right-wing media, which by which I mean the new media the alternative platforms. I'm going to talk about Rumble, Locals, and I'm going to have to touch on Daily Wire, but I'm going to do a whole separate video on them one day. Tucker Carlson, Dave Rubin, Eric and Brett Weinstein. I'm going to talk a little bit about Andrew Tate and 
Towards the end, I hope I get time for this. I want to bring up Vivek Ramaswamy. Yes, meet the new media, same as the old media. For a couple of reasons, because he is on Jordan Peterson's ARC organizing committee, and he's running for president. He's also being promoted by all these suspects that I'm going to talk about today and more. I'm going to talk about some of the investors that are involved in these um, entities. And then I'm going to, at the end, talk about the Rumble partners and executives. Boom. That's where the boom's going to be, I think. Uh, there's several boomy things in this video, but you are not going to like what I have to say about the stated partners and some of the executives on social media platform Rumble. All right. First, I want to talk about this. This page actually has been taken down from the net. I, it was still available in a cached version, and that's what I'm showing you here. It's talking about how pharma companies basically own the news because they've spent in 11 months $3.2 billion on TV ads for drugs. But the important part here is they're talking about Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who, if you don't know, is running for president. The Democrat, well, he's running for the Democratic nomination in the race for president in the United States. So Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has been a very outspoken advocate for people who have been injured by the pharma companies, specifically vaccines. And he's been doing this all through the years, many, many, many years, making documentaries about it. Anyway, so he wanted to show his film, Trace Amounts, which was about mercury toxicity in vaccines, and he was getting no coverage. And he said this, I talked to Roger Ailes, who was then CEO of Fox News, and he said he's known Roger Ailes since he was 17 years old. This is the exact quote. He's very sympathetic with this issue and saw the film Trace Amounts. I said to him, I just want to go on one of your shows. Nobody will allow me to talk about this or debate me. And Roger said to me, I can't allow you on any of them. I'd have to fire any of my hosts that allowed you on my station because, he said, my news division gets up to 70% of advertising revenues during non-election years from the pharmaceutical companies. Boom. So Roger Ailes retired from as CEO of Fox in, I think, 27, 2016. Then he died in 2017. But things have only gotten worse since then. If you if you pay attention on CNN, on Fox, on all the major news stations, even on award shows now, there's there's jokes and memes about it brought to you by Pfizer. I mean, there's just constant drug ads and you notice them. They're very noticeable ads because they usually have that ukulele music or some like beautiful scenery and old people with children together. And then at the end, it's like, because blindness, blah, 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 blah. you know, consult your doctor. Ask and if you remember, Tucker was maybe the only news anchor, host, personality, whatever you want to call him that was actually pushing back against the big pharma ad model in network news to the point where at one time he was not being sponsored by literally anybody. Uh, his, his nightly one hour show was receiving no ad money from anyone who was contributing to the Fox News network. Uh, they would dump billions into the coffers of Fox News and Tucker would get zero from it. Allegedly, allegedly, that was the, uh, the case that was put out there and also was pointed to as one of the reasons potentially why he got fired uh, or was relieved of his duties. Let's put it that way, because he wasn't actually technically fired. He is still under contract from what I understand. Uh, but that was pointed to as one of the many, many reasons why he was removed from his duties. Let's keep going. Ask your doctor to give you this prescription. You don't even know what it's for half the time on the ads. But anyway, the point is that television news can't show what it wants to show you, especially if it's reporting on adverse drug events, because pharma has captured so much of the news. It pays for so much of the news. 
By the way, I suppose this included Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson probably didn't talk to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. about this film, Trace Amounts, either. Okay, and now let's, let's fast forward to today. Tucker Carlson, he says he was blindsided when he was fired by Fox News yesterday. But in this article, you'll notice it's right in the headline, he was negotiating a new contract when Murdoch fired him. Huh, okay. So, why is this important? Well, because I believe Tucker has, become, has been becoming more and more outspoken. He has been doing more and more cross promotion or promotion, sorry, of uh, these alternative media people that I was just talking to you about. Over the last year, people cheer him on like he's a voice of the truth in mainstream media, and perhaps he sort of is, but I don't know if he was really that blindsided or if he has been positioning himself for this moment for quite a while. And that is an excellent question because if you pay close attention to the description that she was giving of the type of person that Tucker was becoming, well, that would fit Dave Rubin before he got canceled. That would fit Brett Weinstein before he got canceled. Hmm. Is there a pattern developing here? All right. Why do I say that? Because of this situation that's going on in the background. Because of Peter Thiel and Dave Rubin and J.D. Vance's investment company because of the Daily Wire and the people involved in that because of Twitter and Elon Musk because of Jordan Peterson and his arc and his contracts that overlap some of these things and his walking in lockstep with Elon Musk on Twitter lately who actually was the guy who unbanned Jordan Peterson they're building something here and in a 2018 Esquire magazine interview, Jordan Peterson told the interviewer that he had been meeting with both Peter Thiel and Mark Andreessen from Andreessen Horowitz on an undisclosed project. Now, I don't know if that was in 2017 or 2018 that he had these meetings, but it was 2018 when the article was published. That's a very interesting wrinkle. What was Jordan Peterson working on? What was this undisclosed project with Andreessen and Thiel? We're not even going to look at Mark Andreessen and his company today, but they are worth a dig because his partner here, Horowitz, it might, he might as well be Karl Marx or Che Guevara. He is out and out commie and he writes about it right on the blog. It's stunning how extremist that guy is. These are very influential people who seem to have a talent for playing one side off against the other in order to drum up the news stories, drum up the outrage, drum up the fear that will help their own other personal investments pay off. It's like what Bill Gates does with his Gavi, the vaccine alliance, and then his partnership with media organizations like The Guardian, where he has stories planted in there for, you know, malaria or different diseases that he wants people to be upset about. And then he can swoop in with his other investments into malaria and medication and say he's a savior of the planet. Okay. It's the same thing. It's just different topics. And these guys' big topic right now the one they seem to be making the most hay with is the transgender thing. If the transgender thing actually went away and got solved, these guys would potentially lose a lot of money. They're using it. They're using it to win favor, to win influence, and to possibly profit. As I always say, all the world is staged, folks. I have to bring up the intellectual dark web because, of course, Jordan Peterson was a main player in that. But so were Brett and Eric Weinstein. Brett Weinstein, you know, from the Dark Horse podcast. He's an evolutionary biologist. 
Eric Weinstein was originator of the term intellectual dark web, and he is an advisor to Peter Thiel's venture capital firm. And then we have Jordan Peterson, who has a contract with The Daily Wire. He has a YouTube channel. He has a Twitter, which was reinstated by Elon Musk. And of course, I've done several videos about his new organization, the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship, ARC. And, and Jordan Peterson is a clinical psychologist, and I've heard him refer to evolutionary psychology, which goes along with Eric or Brett's evolutionary biology. And those two appeared quite often together back in the heyday of the intellectual dark web. And then we have Joe Rogan. He has the number one podcast. He's the everyman character. He appeals to conservatives, to males, and he promotes drug culture and he cross promotes all the other people that you could ever want. Kind of from the left and the right, Joe Rogan is a trickster character, sort of. Uh, Dave Rubin, he's a podcaster, he's conservative, he says he's a gay man, he's anti-censorship, sane voice of the LGBT, and not the T probably, and he created the Locals platform, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Ben Shapiro uh, is Jewish, very, meh, 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 meh. got famous for calling Piers Morgan a bully, and um he is an investor and founder of the Daily Wire. He's their main ticket. He's the big show, but was another one who really pushed the vaccines and, and all of that. Super ironic calling Ben Shapiro the big show, uh, but I'm digressing. And then finally, we have uh, Barry Weiss, who is not technically part of the intellectual dark web, but she's very key to them uh, getting their word out. And she's also been very key in getting the Twitter files out. So she's kind of an honorary member of the intellectual dark web. They need tentacles into the mainstream media to bring the eyes onto their other operations. Slowly but surely, they won't need that anymore because, as I said, this whole video is about how they are building the media empire. Eric Weinstein, he got nervous sometime after Epstein got arrested and he did a whole long detailed podcast about how he met Epstein one time, got super creeped out by him, so he says, and um, his thrust of what he thought Epstein was doing out there in the world was he said he knew that uh, it was difficult for researchers into the biotech and gene editing, all the biosciences, it was difficult for them to get funding anymore. And so he says Jeffrey Epstein saw a niche and was trying to court those people. But you got to remember, Eric Weinstein was, was meeting with Epstein apparently as in his capacity as a venture fund capitalist himself. So why would the two of them meet together? You would think that they would have to have some crossed interests that perhaps Eric was also trying to secure funding for some of these weirder biotech startups like CRISPR and all of those things. And I mean, it's just exploded. The money into biotech is the, the, the top money um, in venture capital, and it has been for many years now. So Eric Weinstein says, Jeffrey Epstein saw this niche and he thinks that's what it was all about, although he says it might have also been for spying purposes. So what is what is what was Eric Weinstein's purpose? It could be the exact same thing, if you ask me. It's funny. Accuse the other side of that which you're doing, right? Well, there's that. And then there's also that these two brothers, Eric and uh Brett. Oops, let me plug the old pooter in so that the battery don't die on us because we're not even halfway through this thing yet. But these Weinstein brothers just kind of came onto the scene like a lightning strike, right? Uh, back when the whole uh, intellectual dark web narrative was being bandied around in the late 20 teens uh, is when I remember first hearing about them. It might have been around about the same time that you remember first hearing about them. And of course, that was also 
around the same time when Brett was being ousted from Evergreen University by the um, activist students, we'll say, totally not funded or directed by any uh, Hungarian Jewish money or anything like that, I'm sure. Uh, but I'm digressing and we still got quite a ways to go. Let's get back to it. I'm not defending Jeffrey Epstein. Don't get your panties in a bunch. I'm just saying it was an odd thing for Eric Weinstein to do. And keep in mind, he was probably, he could have been working for Peter Thiel at that time. And Peter Thiel has tons and tons of investments into biotechnology the thing that we're all suffering from right now because that is hogging up all the air and all the money in the world. And it's all about trying to get in there and change our genes and transform us into cyborgs. It's really negative stuff. Okay, where am I going? Oh yeah, Eric Weinstein's dad and this Brett Weinstein, of course, his dad, Les Weinstein, is a patent lawyer, and he does corporate arbitration in some big cases, for example, Uber. He also coaches lawyers on social science things, how to get the psychology of a jury in order to win your cases. Total coincidence, y'all. Nothing to see there at all. Now, remember, his son, Brett, is an expert in these matters and and he's an influencer i mean he is an evolutionary biologist and he talks a lot about psychology and that sort of thing and his other son venture capitalists edge.org that was another thing that eric weinstein belonged to so in that capacity he would have been in touch with all of these scientists involved in biotech we've talked about it on this channel many many times i've I've talked about the Franken scientists that populated edge.org and their billionaire dinners were funded year after year by Jeffrey Epstein. That is an undeniable fact. Okay, it is all connected. Another thing that you have to know how pivotal Eric Weinstein is to all of this is Dave Rubin says, over the last two years, I've become friends with Peter Thiel through his friend and confidant, Eric Weinstein. And this was in 2018. So, it already, okay, so Eric Weinstein somehow meets Dave Rubin, puts him in touch with Peter Thiel. He becomes a big podcaster. He's an influencer. What did he want him for? Well, it just so happens that after a few years podcasting, when Dave Rubin and then Jordan Peterson started working together, they said they were going to start this alternative payment system and an alternative platform for content creators. And then Jordan Peterson, if you recall, got really sick. He disappeared. And Dave Rubin went ahead and did this project without Jordan Peterson, and he ended up calling it Locals. If you look further into Locals, however, it really wasn't a Dave Rubin project. It was put together by some venture capitalists and he partnered up with a guy called uh, Asaf Lev and he's Israeli and he ran an Israeli security company or an Israeli something to do with tech, something to do with the online world. So Dave Rubin all of a sudden is in partnership with a guy from Israel called Asaf Lev on this Locals project. He gets some early funding in March 2020, but then a year later, they got $3.8 million worth of round two funding, which was led by something called Kraft Ventures. Kraft Ventures is owned by David O. Sachs, another person who is closely tied to Peter Thiel because they were in what's called the PayPal Mafia together. The PayPal Mafia is you should, there's probably videos about it out there. I'm sure there are. You should go watch one. These handful of people that were involved supposedly in setting up PayPal all together, say, I don't know, 15 or 20 of them. Most of them have gone on to found and still head some of the most influential and woke companies that are out there that a lot of them belong to the World Economic Forum and are on the panels 
talking about the fourth industrial revolution. So it's very, very influential. So it isn't that interesting that that's what happened with Dave Rubin's supposedly, supposedly Dave Rubin's locals. That's who set this up. Israel, venture capital funds, but oh no, it's just friendly conservative gay guy, Dave Rubin. Yeah, he just thought of this idea and, you know, learned all the tech on his own. No, no. I wonder which version of that history Michael Malice believes. Anyway. No, 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 no. He was a figurehead. And then we find out that in 2021, Rumble acquired locals. And look at some of the people that are involved in this. So there's Scott Adams. And what's Scott Adams been doing? He's got the racism file, doesn't he? Scott Adams is doing the outrage about race. He's got Tulsi Gabbard, former, um, f f f did she run for the Democrat nomination for president? I believe she did. Michael Malice, who is a, a like, I don't know, I don't watch his show, but it looks like he's an anarchist to me. Viva and Barnes. You know, Robert Barnes, he's the guy who defended Kyle Rittenhouse and Nick Sandman, two huge lawsuits. What's that again? The Outrage Machine. The Outrage Machine, he's he's their big lawyer guy and his partner here, this cracks me up. Viva, uh, Viva Fry, real name David Fryheit, um, gained fame with a squirrel video, a viral squirrel video years ago, got the bug. And ever since he's been chasing a way to get famous on the internet. And then the trucker convoy happened in Canada. He appears out of nowhere doing daily live streams, just walking around Ottawa and talking to people. And uh, next thing you know, he's hooked up with Barnes out of the States for a show and he's got a partnership with Rumble and he's promoted all over the place. Hmm. Now that has something to do with the fact that he was hooked up with the phony leader of the convoy, BJ Dichter. B.J. Dichter, who ended up getting the $20 million, two different fundraisers of $10 million frozen. He was going through the convoy advocating for crypto and the crypto wallets all got taken offline or something. Look, there's something really wrong with B.J. Dichter, but most of these guys who I'm going to mention today had him on their shows. Tucker had him on the show. Dave Rubin had him on the show. Viva had him on the show. Uh... Jordan Peterson had him on the show more than once. Jordan Peterson's daughter had him on the show more than once. Just some Canadian trucker guy, BJ Dichter, whose name you probably don't even know. Yeah, that's actually what me, got me looking into all of this in the first place. All right, but that, those, those are not the only creators. Or she moves on. Uh, I'm glad that she took the time to point that out because Ever since it happened, there's something about the trucker convoy that has not been sitting right with me. And I don't know exactly what it is, uh, but something about it just was, wasn't right, wasn't organic, wasn't genuine. And I'm not saying that everybody that was involved uh, is reflective of that sentiment, but there, there's just something that seemed really, really really off with how it all went down. Anyway, let's continue. That Rumble kind of bought when they bought locals. There's also Charlie Kirk, Alan Dershowitz, Russell Plant Brand, Glenn Greenwald, Stephen Crowder, Michael Yon, Liz Wheeler, Dan Bongino, blah, 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 Andy No, possibly Paul Joseph Watson. Like, I'm not saying that uh, they ever even talked to any of these people. I know they talked to some of them. But others might have just been on the platform and then they sort of had to go over to this new new ownership. You know, I'm not saying they have contracts with each of these people, but they might because they have with some. And of course, then what happened? So Rumble buys locals and shortly thereafter, Peter Thiel gave Rumble a ton of investment money along with somebody else who I'll talk about in a minute. Then this is when we started getting in the big contracts. Like Glenn Greenwald actually has a proper contract with Rumble where they gave him a salary and they gave him a staff. And some of them 
uh, like the Daily Wire people have to go in to a professional studio. These have to be professionally produced, all right? And there's nothing wrong with this. I'm just letting you know that they aren't just producing their own little show in their spare room at home. They are under contract, six-figure contracts, or, you know, I don't know how high to produce these things for Rumble. And here's some more. And that's an important point to point out as well. Uh, I know I just said point like twice within five words there. I'll work on that. But Polly makes a fantastic uh, observation there in that these programs, these personalities, influencers, whatever the fuck you want to call them, right? That are presented to us as being the best of the alternative to the mainstream media. Most of these productions are being done by companies that have budgets and have staffs that they can delegate uh, the, the different responsibilities of the production to so that they can produce something that looks highly professional in order to compare to what the rest of the mainstream media is producing something that looks looks appears to be identical to the quality of what is being produced by the lamestream media most of the podcasts or independent media programs that you enjoy don't have these advantages. They're doing it without a budget or on a shoestring budget if they have one. They're doing it with equipment that they've been able to cobble together from what is available around them. And then they're just essentially pouring their heart and soul into the production to try and give the audience the best possible quality product based on all of the different components that came together in producing it. These people are more like a machine. And, and I'm talking about the, uh, the Glenn Greenwalds, the Dave Rubens, the Michael Malices, so on and so forth. That's more like factory work than it is artistry. That's just my observation. Donald Trump Jr. signed seven figure podcast deal with Rumble. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard strikes deal with Rumble. And then uh, Russell Brand had Rumble's first pay-per-view. Here's Tucker Carlson bigging up Rumble on a show January 5th, 2023. In the, in the age of social media censorship, Rumble video is defending free speech. So yes, cross-promotion, cross-promotion, cross-promotion. Here's somebody else that invested in Rumble at the same time as Peter Thiel did here. Uh, J.D. Vance, along with his partners in something called Naria Capital. But the funniest part is, it seems like that's a separate thing, right? And I guess technically it is. But when you look at J.D. Vance's background, guess what? He served as principal at Peter Thiel's venture capital firm, Mithril Capital. Oh, my goodness. Now, you see, he worked directly for Peter Thiel, and then he sets up his own venture capital firm, and boom, he invests in the same thing Peter Thiel invests in, Rumble. <laughs> I got a question for you. Who out in the audience, just like I did, discovered that Peter Thiel is a Dungeons & Dragons nerd? Who's really pulling the strings on this stuff? Here's Naria Capital's other investments besides Rumble. This one invests in farmland. This one is an online only insurance company. Here we've got gene therapy. They develop, manufacture, and treat patients. Here's another one, biotech accelerate vaccines. How do you like that one? True anomaly is space security and spacecraft. Halo is a daily prayer app. There's where you get, oh, we're just nice Christian boys. Chapter is Medicare Guidance and Strive. Oh, they're involved in Strive Asset Management. That is cool because I'm going to talk about that later and I hadn't even noticed. 
Does this sound any different than the uh, fourth industrial revolution, great reset type investments that the other side is making? It's not different, it's just competition. They're in competition with Bill Gates and George Soros and BlackRock and, and I mean, maybe that's good. They do seem a little more sane because they wanna get rid of social, emotional investments or what, and DEI and ESG and all of that. They wanna get rid of that apparently. That's what Strive Capital is. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay, now back to Tucker though, because a couple months ago, Tucker just started acting weird and he showed up on this little sort of garage podcast. I don't even know what it is. I don't know where he was, but he started saying all kinds of home homeboy type things and he was acting really casual. This person says, this is on March 14th, after watching this video, you do realize Tucker could be fired for saying this. And I said, this whole thing was probably orchestrated for his eventual rumble contract. Because at the time I'd been studying about all these people getting sucked into the rumble vortex. You know, a lot of them lefties as well. Glenn Greenwald, for example, Tulsi Gabbard, for example. This wasn't all, I mean, Russell Brand, but they're the new right, don't you know? Anyway, and then I made another tweet after that one. I said, I think it's in prep for his contract with Rumble or Daily Wire, I guessed. Nah, it'll be Rumble, but they all work together, so it doesn't really matter. So I'm asking you now, when, when will Tucker appear on Dave Rubin's show for his interview or Jordan Peterson's in, uh, show? Both of them, both of them could be soon and should be soon. Perhaps they're already doing it as I record this. And you're like, you're late, Polly. Well, maybe, but I haven't seen it yet, but I do predict it's coming. And remember, uh, Jordan Peterson had that undisclosed project with Peter Thiel and Mark Andreessen. Does this have anything to do with it? You know, it, it'd be a long game. They're playing the long game, but you can see, I can see, it's all accelerating. Now here's a bizarre thing in that same podcast, sort of weird stopped by for a chat thing that Tucker Carlson did, which was supposedly impromptu at, at this guy's place. You see, he's, he's drinking beer, he's just chatting, he's just, just being a normal human and they caught it on video. Um, they talk about Andrew Tate for a while, and Tucker says that Andrew Tate's core message is basically put down the porn and go and do something useful. <laughs> I had to laugh. This was on Gab. I posted this on Gab because it's like Tucker Carlson doesn't have any idea what Andrew Tate is really up to, what his business is. Maybe he's just buying the hype that he heard from his from all the people on Daily Wire and Joe Rogan and Steven Crowder who all stepped up to defend Andrew Tate because that's what happened. I covered it in another video. Jordan Peterson at the time stood up for Andrew Tate, but of course he has a contract with Daily Wire. So he might've been required to stand up for Andrew Tate. But why would that be? It's so confusing as to why so many of these people right here went out of their way to make videos defending Andrew Tate when he first got arrested, because he's been arrested in Romania, for those of you who don't know. And that is something that should always throw up a red flag. Whenever you see people in the media circling the wagons around a specific individual, it's not because they care about that person. I guarantee it. It's because it was orchestrated to make you feel a certain way about that person. For um, all kinds of things. He, he does these webcam sex things. I don't even want to talk about it. But suffice to say, he's not encouraging men to give up porn. <laughs> he's producing it, okay? This might have had something to do with it. In September 2022, Andrew Tate went on this YouTube channel called Valuetainment. It's a pretty big YouTube channel. So here's Andrew Tate sitting here telling them about how Rumble saved him, basically. He said he, he praised Rumble to the skies because he said that he was in the process of, or had just finished, negotiating a multi-million dollar contract with them to bring his show over onto that platform. He, he was only arrested on December 29th, a couple months later. So all the Daily Wire people 
and the rumble investors that all kind of crisscross each other in the background, they probably wanted to see, they wanted to wait a while and protect their investment. Would Andrew Tate get out of jail? Would the media frenzy around it die down? Would, because Andrew Tate was making a lot of money and these guys probably wanted a piece of it. And they wanted the audience that he brought, which was a lot of young men in his audience. And he was like building an Oprah type thing. You know how Oprah used to say, um, I don't like hamburgers. And suddenly the sale of hamburgers would drop. She was actually sued for that. That's a true story. Um, or she would say, buy this book. And of course, sales for that book would skyrocket. Well, like him or don't like him, that was the type of power allegedly, Andrew Tate had over a demographic that these guys really wanted to see. So it makes sense that they would go out there and defend him because maybe they did have a contract with him. He says that he had one. Forgive me for kind of going off track here. But Andrew Tate rose to fame due to his appearance of Big Brother. Now, who owns the UK franchise of Big Brother? It's a guy called John DeMall Jr., and that happens to be the same guy, the same company that produced Fear Factor. And if you recall, Joe Rogan got his start in TV on Fear Factor. That's where he really came into prominence. Joe Rogan was a kickboxer. He was a comedian. So it's funny because Andrew Tate was a kickboxer and he was on a game show and Joe Rogan was a kickboxer on the game show Fear Factor and they're both produced by this same guy who is one of the 500 richest people in the world. You seeing a pattern yet? And I'm just wondering if they were trying to set up another version of Joe Rogan. That's what they're, they had a lot riding maybe on Andrew Tate and then Somehow he just suddenly gets arrested and taken right out of the picture. And I know there's a lot of Joe Rogan fanboys and fangirls out there, but I've got to tell you, I liked him enough. I didn't really care about him one way or the other, but I knew of him from Fear Factor. And I knew because he, he appeared on Alex Jones a couple of times and they would talk about conspiracy theories. Then all of a sudden, in 2012, Joe Rogan announces that he's going to be host of a show about conspiracy theories and I got really excited. I thought, oh, awesome, because on Alex Jones's show, Joe Rogan talked like he was red-pilled. He talked like he believed in a lot of the alternative media stories about a lot of things. But he betrayed everyone. He betrayed everyone. He went and investigated HARP and weaponized weather and was like, that nah, doesn't exist. I never saw these other two, because I was so upset with Rogan by this point. But look, he also investigated whether the big boys were trying to make man into machine. He looks at the idea of robo sapiens, which we would call transhumans now. Topics included downloading the brain and living forever as the body is replaced. Didn't I just do a video about that? and how real it is that they're really trying to do this. That people with huge power and influence and, and tons of money have already set up companies doing this and have they've had these companies for years. And that transhumanism is like the next off growth of transgenderism. And that's why they're pushing it so hard because once you can divorce a person from the reality of biology, it's a lot easier to just get them to go, well, why? Yeah, why wouldn't I put a chip in my brain? Why wouldn't I have bionic legs? Why wouldn't I have whatever they want to do? Most of it's genetic modification. We always think of great, you know, innovations for people who are paralyzed. That's what they tell us. It, they tell us it's about Parkinson's disease and deafness, but it's mostly about genetic engineering and brain computer interfaces, which will be injected right into your body. Okay, I keep digressing, but it, guys, it is all connected and I have a hard time. I have a really hard time, you know, controlling myself <laughs> when not going off on these tangents. I can totally sympathize uh, with her on that. All right, so that was 
That was Joe Rogan. I mentioned him because of his similarity to Andrew Tate. And Andrew Tate was getting a contract with Rumble. And Rumble just wants to collect a bunch of influencers so that they're the people um, who are currently not part of the in crowd of Fourth Industrial Revolution future can get their pieces of the pie. They want to generate the narrative. And a lot of these people overlap anyway. Okay, so that's that's why. And then I want to bring it back to Eric Weinstein because he's not the one with the podcast. He's not a charismatic guy. He's the one who worked for Peter Thiel. But he's somehow appeared on Joe Rogan, number one podcast in the world. He has somehow appeared on Joe Rogan five times. That's an awful lot. Why? Why five times for somebody who is always outside of the public spotlight? That doesn't make any sense. Of appearances for a guy that really has nothing to say, some venture capitalist, who cares? Who cares what he says? He's a bit of a whiner, too, i got to tell you. And he gives, he gives me a tranny vibe. Just get it over with, Eric. Just do it. Do it. You know you want to. It's probably the hair that's given her that vibe. That's that's where it comes from for me. Erica. Erica Weinstein. <laughs> okay. Remember earlier I said the thing that got me interested in looking into this actually was a guy called BJ Dichter, the Freedom Convoy, Trucker Convoy in Canada guy who was interviewed by all the people, blah, blah. Well, check this out. This happened in 2022. Freedom Convoy spokesman Ben Dichter announced as Bitcoin 2022 conference speaker, along with Peter Thiel and Jordan Peterson. What? What? Jordan Peterson? I mean, what does he know about crypto? Uh, Peter Thiel has recently hinted that he doesn't think Bitcoin is freedom money anymore. So that's an interesting development. But yeah. What what are those three doing together? Oh, because I just showed you why they're all together. Because this is the new Vanguard. This, we are the news now. This is the new story that ARC is going to weave. Don't forget all of that. That plays into this too. That's the British contingent of hedge funds and venture capital. Okay, I am really getting behind here. I want it, the boom. Remember the green question mark? I said Rumble's partner organizations and their executives are going to be the thing that really blows your mind. All right. Well, here's the first example of this. Ready? Users upload videos that are licensed to Rumble's partners. Rumble's partners such as Yahoo and Microsoft News. Whoa. So Rumble has a contract with Microsoft News and others. We don't, I don't know who the rest of them are. Okay, so that's boom number one. And finally here from Rumble's information page where they talk about their corporate governance. We have Tyler Hughes. He's the chief operating officer of Rumble. He spent a decade in the pharmaceutical industry with Bayer, head of marketing for Bayer's newly formed AI-based enterprise software business in pharmaceuticals. But don't worry, guys. Rumble is totally here to save us. Totes. And remember, Bear is now Bear Monsanto. They're one company now. So yes, the chief operating officer of Rumble, Tyler Hughes, comes from Bear Pharmaceuticals. Now look at the guy below. This is even worse. General counsel and corporate secretary of Rumble, Michael Ellis. He was in the U.S. intelligence community, inside the White House, in Congress, in the NSA. He was Senior Director of Intelligence Programs at the National Security Council as well. That guy, Rumble, he's at Rumble now. So he's not just at Rumble, he's the top lawyer at Rumble. So he gets to decide what's legal and what isn't. Isn't that interesting? Why did he leave his post? In objection or what? I don't know. And. I really want to make this point. You have to keep in mind that sometimes there are good guys involved and they leave in disgust. So some of these people, they might be wanting to do the right thing now and they might have figured getting involved with social media 
gives them that pathway. So as I am casting all these clouds over these people, remember, maybe, maybe some of them are gen have really good intentions. So um, this is what it looks like. This is what Rumble and supposedly the new free speech platforms of Rumble and Locals and Daily Wire. They're all supposed to be right wing, but they include a whole bunch of lefties who cross promote each other. And then meanwhile, in the background, Rumble partners with Microsoft, Yahoo. Its executives are from the pharma industry and the intelligence community. You tell me whether we've really broken free of anything at all yet or not. All right, thanks for sticking through this with me. Uh, go to amazingpolly.net. That's my website. You're going to find all kinds of things there. If all right. Well, she, I would imagine, does a good enough job of promoting herself, considering that that video, which I think has only been out a week or less. Let's take a look. Let's actually go back here. Let's find out when this came out. First published April 26, 2023. So less than a week ago, and it's already gotten more than 20,000 views on BitChute, which I would say by itself uh, is impressive, let alone gathering 20,000 views anywhere without having some sort of media machine behind you like uh, Dave Rubin and Jordan Peterson and the Weinstein brothers do. Well, I thought that was a very informative and very, um, what is the word, illuminating video. I did not know every single fact that Polly presented in that video, but I did know quite a few of them. And some of the ones that I didn't know, I had actually had my suspicions about one of the things that I learned from this video was about uh, Brett Weinstein, as a matter of fact, co-host of the Dark Horse podcast with his wife, Heather Hying, I'm sorry, Dr. Heather Hying, uh, and Dr. Brett Weinstein. I know they worked very, very hard for those titles, so I don't want to cheat them as far as that is concerned. But I did not know that Brett had a position as advisor to Peter Thiel's venture capital firm. I don't think that I've ever actually heard him disclose that on his podcast. Now, granted, I haven't listened to every single podcast that he's done. I've listened to, uh, I would say, probably roughly about half within the last year because he does get some very good guests on and he asks them excellent questions. And it's usually a really, really good conversation. Me being an egghead, I really appreciated a lot of the programs that, that he has produced. But again, I, I don't think I've ever heard him mention anything about a relationship to uh, billionaire Peter Thiel, you know, which I would imagine just in the course of doing a show over a multitude of years, yeah, the subject might come up once or twice, don't you think? I don't know. I thought that was uh, interesting. I also like how she uh, was able to figure out the, the relationship chain, right? Uh, Ruben to Weinstein's to Peter Thiel, and that's kind of how, uh, how things were directed. I'm interested to do my own research on Asaf Lev, uh, I'm curious to find out if uh, maybe he has some sort of relationship to the old unit 8200, which was uh, scattered to the winds several, several years ago in much the same fashion that uh, JFK wanted to do to the CIA back in the 1960s. But somehow I don't think that that action had the effect of reducing the influence of unit 8200. I think it, it just actually ended up infiltrating the uh, tech sector at large and uh, still continues in many, many different forms today. But that's my opinion. I'm entitled to it. Your results may vary. Uh, what, what did you guys think of the video? Did you learn anything new? 
that you didn't know before watching it? Did you have any of your illusions shattered in the process of watching this video? That's kind of what it's all about. You know, uh, we come into this world and we grow up and we're told a bunch of stories about what the world looks like. And it seems to me that the older that I get, uh, the less those stories bear any resemblance to objective reality. And uh, that's part of the reason why I started manufacturing reality media in the first place. I realized that pretty much across the board, we're, we're being lied to. Not just about what is happening in our day-to-day -day world, the current events that we observe and watch on the news and read in the newspapers or on the blogs or however you get your news. There are a multitude of ways these days. Uh, none of that stuff is true. None of it's true. And not only that, the history that we have been taught to use as context for the events that we observe in our world happening every day. Most of that stuff isn't true either. It was just made up to provide a nice, tidy little package as far as the events of history are concerned. So that's why we do what we do uh, here at Manufacturing Reality Media. Of course, you can always help us in that particular uh, endeavor. And let's see, let me... Pull all the stuff back up here. Are we back online yet? There we go. I see amazing Polly. I'll let you guys see. I actually do this. I'm going to give this video a thumbs up, and I'm also going to subscribe to her channel because, again, I found the time that I spent with that video valuable, so I would imagine that uh, I'm probably uh, in agreement with at least 115,000 other people, which is how many are subscribed to her BitChute channel. I'm going to take a wild guess and say she's probably not on YouTube uh, anymore if she ever was to begin with. But if you found value in that video, go ahead and uh, head over to Polly's website. Give her a follow. Give her a like. Watch some videos. It really does help with the algorithm, folks. And after you do that, if you feel like it, you can always head over here to manufacturingreality.org. Click the button at the top that says provide value, and uh, you can send us a few shekels to help us continue in our quest. And uh, I think that's going to be just about it for today. Uh, again, what did you guys think of the video? Let me know down in the comments. I'm sure at some point I'll be back with another one of these. Just have to have something cross the radar. So until that time comes around again, uh, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, grow some food, learn some skills, and uh, we'll keep trucking right along uh, to 2030, if not beyond. And we'll see you guys next time.